Well, welcome again, and at this time I will call the March 13th Board of Commissioners Pauley County Work Session to order. And I hope to see any elected officials with us this morning. We uh, are extremely delighted to have Pastor Johnny Nix with us here from Pickensville Baptist Church. Johnny, thanks for coming. Thank you for the wonderful tribute to uh, Dr. Graham, what a great soldier of the cross, great man of faith. Let's bow for prayer together. Dear Father, as we come to you in Jesus' name, we thank you for the privilege and the opportunity uh, to pray and open an invocation for this wonderful group of people that lead our county. Dear Father, we pray for each of our commissioners, their families. We pray for all of our leaders and workers all of our public servants within our county that serve our county so well. We pray for your watch care, safety in their lives. We pray that you keep them out of harm's way. And dear Father, we pray today that the decisions that are made on behalf of our county would uh, reflect you and would honor you in every way. I pray, dear Father, that you would guard our hearts and lives, help us to be committed to you, Dear Father, help us to seek your face, turn from our wicked ways, and may we receive the healing for our land that we so desperately need. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Pastor Nix, thanks so much. If I didn't say it, it's Pickett's Mill Baptist Church on Highway 92. Got a great congregation there. I'd like to ask the uh, sign-up sheet to um, yes, bring that forward. And uh, if you have a, any kind of device, phone or whatever, uh, please silence that. Uh, at this time, I'd like to excuse one of our commissioners, uh, Commissioner Crow, who uh, has got a family need to attend to. So I wanted to come in and um, hope to be back uh, maybe uh, during the middle of this meeting. So, Gary Davidson. Thank you. And I, I'll try to be back. My father in law was left this morning by way of ambulance. My wife is with him now mm -hmm. at the hospital. I need to check on her and him. So I'm just asking y'all to excuse me and forgive me for it, okay? Under minutes, the uh, January 23rd, 2018 amended board meeting minutes and February 27th work session minutes along with the board meeting minutes are available for review. Under our positively polling statement this morning, we have a featured Academy Award winner, Mr. George Jones, to talk a little bit about the Highway 92 widening. My name is George Jones. I'm the Transportation Director for Baldwin County. I'd like to discuss the State Route 92 road widening project that recently commenced construction activities in Baldwin County. This project will widen State Route 92 starting at Malone Road in Douglas County and going north to Neva Road in Baldwin County. This project is funded and being managed by the Georgia Department of Transportation. The total project length is 6.93 miles, which includes three bridges. The Paulding County project length is 5.65 miles, and the Douglas County project length is 1.28 miles. From Malone Road to Bill Crew Parkway, the project will widen the existing State Route 92 from one lane in each direction to three lanes in each direction with a 20-foot to 24-foot raised median, including turn lanes at certain intersections. This section of road will be designed as a 55-mile-per-hour roadway. From Bill Crew Parkway to Nebo Road, the project will widen existing State Route 92 from one lane in each direction to two lanes in each direction with a 20-foot to 24-foot raised median, including turn lanes at certain intersections. This section of the road will be designed as a 45-mile-per-hour roadway. Roundabouts are not included as part of the project. All existing traffic signals will be rebuilt as part of the project to accommodate the road widening. This section of State Route 92 is designed to accommodate an estimated average daily traffic volume of 33,000 vehicles per day in year 2039. 
The construction contract was awarded to C.W. Matthews Construction Company in the amount of $51,173,350. The construction lead date for this project was October 17, 2017, and the current completion date is July 31, 2022. <coughs> Please keep in mind there will be lane closures on State Route 92 and side road closures at certain intersections through the course of the project. The Georgia Department of Transportation has worked to minimize the delays by not allowing lane closures through peak hour time periods and minimizing road closures to a maximum of 10 days per location. With each side road closure, a sign detour route will be in place to provide access. This is the first Georgia Department of Transportation road widening project in Paulding County since June 1995, so obviously we're very happy to get this project underway. This project will considerably improve the travel conditions on State Route 92 when completed. Notice my dirt went the farthest. <laughs> and uh, Ms. Skipper just told me that Representative Graves was honorable mention in the Academy Awards. <laughs> Scott told me not to try to be funny. It, it is super. <laughs> uh, it, it is great to have Chief Belfry and a lot of his white shirts in here this morning uh, to uh, discuss life-saving accommodations for Pauley County Fire Department and the Metro Ambulance personnel. So thank you for having us today. Uh, my name is Steve Mapes. For those that don't know me, I've been with the county for 22 years. So, quick preamble. In case everybody in this room is not aware, firefighters, uh, marshals, sheriffs, deputies, police officers, we're a little bit different. That was supposed to be fun. <laughs> it's early. <laughs> we know your chief is. <laughs> Continue on. We go into untenable situations, and, and we don't want credit. Um, we don't want to be recognized, but we're going to do that today anyway. But if you ask anybody in this room, law enforcement, fire, police, EMS, every single one of them would say, I'm just doing my job. It's a privilege to serve, something like that. So uh, before I get started with, with our uh, presentation, if you've watched the news today or last night, you saw a Cobb County firefighter went to work yesterday morning and she didn't come home. She um, suffered a heart attack while at work and um, her crew did everything they could to save her. She went to Kennestone and she was pronounced. So Stacy Lee Bulware, end of watch, last night, um, 19 years of service to Cobb County. On October 5th, 2017, in Pauley County, we had a similar incident with a much better outcome. So um, what happened was, we were dispatched to a tractor trailer fire, a very large tractor trailer fire, carrying hazardous materials, flammable liquids. Um, we sent a lot of trucks there. Our first unit on the scene confirmed that this was a flammable liquid fire, uh, instructed engine one, the first truck, fire truck to, to, uh, to arrive, to begin fire suppression activities. Um, so they went to work. Shortly after they started doing that, um, the crew was breaching the back of the truck, which was on fire, and uh, the lieutenant on engine one collapsed. His crew, I'll introduce you to in a minute, um, immediately recognized something was wrong, dragged him away from the fire, pulled his SCBA off, checked his pulse, he was in cardiac arrest. Immediately initiated life-saving interventions. Got an AED, um, shocked him, got a perfusing rhythm back, and for about the next 10 minutes while they were on the scene, continued to treat our lieutenant. A few minutes later, um, Metro Ambulance 802 arrived on the scene, loaded this gentleman up in the ambulance and took him to Paulding ER about half a mile away. They spent an hour, hour and a half there, um, stabilized him, intubated him, he was on a ventilator. Another Metro Ambulance crew, a critical care crew, um, came in and they transported him emergency to Kennestone Hospital where he was directly admitted to the critical care unit. He spent 11 days in a coma in critical care at Kennestone. And um, on the 11th day, 
He awoke. He spent two more days in a step-down unit. And on October 18th, 2017, he was discharged from home 14 days after he went into cardiac arrest on a fire scene. So uh, it's my honor to introduce my friend and colleague, Lieutenant Kevin Van Dyke, our survivor. January 15th, he came back to work full time on a truck with a little extra hardware in his chest, I think. <laughs> so, uh, we'd like to recognize the, the lifesavers who were there that night who took care of Kevin. Um, so, I'm going to call Chief Pelfrey and Leanne Van Dyke and Kevin Van Dyke up to the front, and I'm going to call out a few names. By the way, uh, we're presenting the State of Georgia, the Palmy County Fire and Rescue Lifesaver Award. It's one of the highest awards that we can give. As I said earlier, we don't recognize each other, and we're embarrassed to be recognized, but we're doing it today because this was an extraordinary situation. Uh, in addition, the American Heart Association has provided uh, commendation letters and certificates for saving a life as well. And it, had it not been for the quick action of all of these people, Lieutenant Van Dyke would not have been standing here tonight, or this morning. So. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Engine 1, Brandon Maple, to the front. On Truck 2, Lieutenant Brandon Kirksey. FAO Andy Dale. FAO and, and Paramedic Brad Bolin. On Engine 3, Lieutenant Scott Brown. FAO and paramedic Will Reiner, FAO Blandon, Brandon Pluchow. <laughs> Division Chief Kevin Hart, also a paramedic, Battalion Chief John Parker, Metro Ambulance 802, that transported Kevin to the hospital initially, paramedic Griffin Morris and um, Lydia McIntyre. And last but not least, the critical care unit that volunteered to come in and take our Paulding guy to, um, to Kennestone, um, Chris Aldridge, Karen Robinson, and Michael Murphy.
We have no invited guests. All of your special guests are here today. Bill Ward number one is discuss action to award the replacement of ceiling tile within the Dallas Library to the low bidder, Q McMartin, in the amount of $63,432.78. Ms. Pollock to present. Bill Butter. I am. Thank you. Uh, good morning. This good morning. is a project that we are partnering, partnering with the state. So it's 50% funded by the state, 50% funded by the county, and it is to improve, make improvements to the Dallas Library. Um, specifically, this will replace all the single tiles and we're recommending more to the low bidder. We have three participants and bids, bids range from 63,000 and some change up to 72. Any questions? Ms. Waddell's got a smile on her face. Yes, yes she does. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Bill award number two is discuss action to award the school road over Dunaway Branch Culvert replacement project to the low bidder DC Hudson contracting in the amount of eighty-six thousand two hundred and fifty-nine dollars and fifty-nine cents. Kevin George Gunn. Um, our precincts are 
uh, going down from 14 to 12. As you can see here, here's a list of those. Um, Shelton Elementary School, Burnt Hickory Park, Moses Middle School, Westridge Church, Watson Government Complex, Ragsdale Elementary, Hobby County High School, Hiram High School, Taylor Farm Park, Austin Middle School, Nebo Elementary School, and Scoggins Middle School. Um, believe it or not, by, by cutting our precincts by two for Election Day, it does save this county a lot of money. Um, and that's why we do this. I can't, uh, you know, if I'm going to be tasked with being responsible for taxpayer dollars, I have to look at every aspect of this. And I cannot justify having precincts open that just a few hundred voters go to and pay the staff that we have to pay to go out on election day to do that. So we always are looking at ways that we can save money, and this is one of them. Um, when we did this, we um, based it on a few reasons. Um, we went to the board, we talked to them, we look at numbers, especially now that Colby County is an early voting county. We have a lot of people that vote early. Over half of our voters vote early. So that was one of the reasons that we decided to step back and, and look at this and make some changes. Um, we are going to be changing some of the early voting locations and um, it's to benefit this county. If we're gonna take away precincts, we're not gonna just do that and not add something back to help the voters. Um, we've had a lot of people in the community say, I would, I would vote if you would put something and make it convenient for me, and that's what we have tried to do. Um, I gave you a list of numbers that I want us to focus on because you will see in those numbers the number of people that are registered to vote, it looks like this, I have it in front of you. Um, the people that are registered to vote in those precincts, you look at the number that voted early compared to what they voted on election day, and you see that our numbers are astronomical for early voting. We voted over 43,000 people early in the 2016 election and only 19,000 on election day. Early voting is the way to go. That's, you know, when we look at this from a staffing issue, when there's a problem and you're voting during early voting, we can help you. But if you wait until election day and you don't know there's an issue, maybe you didn't transfer your registration here, maybe you moved, maybe you've been purged because you haven't voted, we can't fix that on election day. So we try to encourage people to vote early because if there is an issue, we can help them. It's important to us that everyone who's eligible to vote gets to vote. So during this time period of early voting, we have 21 days. And if there is a problem, we can correct it. People get to vote that way. Um, I also want to touch on the fact that um, I know that some people don't agree with us voting in churches, but we only have one church up here, and it is going to serve as an election day precinct, and it is also going to serve as an early voting location for one week. When we pick these polling locations, we're looking for three things. The most important is that it is uh, handicap accessible. Number two, we look at the parking. Parking is a premium when it comes to an election day precinct. Several years ago, some of you may remember it, we had so many to turn out to vote in the governor's election that they were parking on the side of Highway 92 to walk to the precinct. That was not good for me, and I have learned my lesson. So when we have election day public locations, we're gonna have plenty of parking. I'm not going to have someone hurt on my watch. Um, in 92, you all know that the crossroads area is a very, very traveled road. So when we're looking at these locations, we look at ADA accessibility, parking, and we look at space. If we're going to consolidate precincts, I'm going to send out more voting machines to be able to accommodate the voters because I don't like the voters appalling to have to stand in line for any length of time. So that's something that we, we talk about, we consider every aspect of it, and that's how we make our decisions. So um, 
I'm hoping that you'll accept these precinct changes. Um, we will be mailing out 104,000 precinct cards to every voter in this county within the next two weeks. I want to tell the public, the voters, if you don't receive a card within the next 30 days, contact our office. We want to know why you have not received a card. These cards will have your new precinct on them. They will let you know where to go. The address of the precinct is on there. It will also give you a listing of who your elected officials are. So there again, if you don't receive a card, contact our office. The last thing that I would like to talk about is kind of away from the precinct issue, but y'all know what we went through in 2016 with people talking about the voting equipment being hacked, that it was, it was a vulnerable system, and I'm here to tell you that it is not. Um, there is a new system on the horizon. We have met with our legislative delegation and we don't see that being implemented until possibly 2022 or 2024. Our system we have is old. We've had the voting machines since 2003. And you'll know how technology changes by the day. But I want to let the voters, I want to let the commissioners, I want everyone to hear me when I say this. The voting machines we have cannot be hacked. They are never networked. They are never connected to the internet. There's a memory card in those voting machines that is taken out, sealed, and locked, and brought to this office on election night for upload. We, there is no way someone can hack those machines. So we will continue to use those machines until the state, <coughs> excuse me, tells us otherwise. But voting in Paulding County is safe. I encourage anyone who wants to visit our office to come see our machines, to come watch the process. We'll start our LNA testing in the uh, middle of April. The public can come see this process. But please, please rest assured and know that when you vote in Pauley County, your vote counts. Do any of y'all have questions? Anything you want to say? Could you uh, highlight just specifically which, which of these locations are the early voting locations? Okay, up here of the voting precincts out of the 12, Watson Government Complex is always an early voting location. We are the only location that votes for 21 days prior to the election. And then, on the um, uh, week prior to the election, we will open up others, and that's why I removed the contracts, because we are going to revisit some of those locations. But on this list here, you have Watson Government Complex and you have Westridge Church, which will serve the week prior to the election and election day. So there again, we're stepping back, re revisiting those contracts, and I'll bring that back to you when we have additional information on those. I'd just like to make a, a comment. I think a few years ago, a couple of years ago, we talked about this too. I don't know when it changed, but we actually used to have 28 polling locations in Paulding County. If you've ever tried to visit those in one day, it's pretty tough. But I know a few folks have done it. And um, But with early voting coming on, it changed things so much because we got so many of the voters that were able to early vote. And so therefore, those precincts went from 28, I think we went right down to 14. That was in 2009. And then, um, and so things have changed through the year, but it's because of the early voting. When you look at the early voting numbers, there's a lot of people that have that opportunity for whether it's a week or the three weeks to get out to those locations. And uh, so, therefore, they've been able to decrease the voting locations on voting day, but give those locations more help. And uh, in the long run, it works out good for everybody. So thanks for your work. I know you guys are always looking at what you can do to make things better for the public, and I appreciate appreciate you and your board. Thank you. Anything else? I also want to add this. Um, we've also seen a decrease since we have the sidewalk voting locations and the early voting in the paper absentee ballots. Um, when we went into the presidential election of 2008, when early voting started, people were not really sure about it. And we had 4,000 paper ballots for that presidential election. That number has been cut in half. 
and that is a huge cost savings to the county because by the time you process an absentee ballot from the application process to receiving that voted ballot back in, you're looking at about $3.50 per ballot. So that's a cost savings. Um, people now, you know, early voting is just a thing for them and they, you know, they don't request those paper ballots anymore. So that's another thing that we, we heavily looked at whenever we started this process. But if you need, you want to come down and look at the maps or have questions, just please contact me and let me know. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Great job. Public participation on agenda items. We're glad to have Mr. Mark Stevenson come forward and share with us on uh, old business item number one. Commissioner, Chairman, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, my name is Mark, Mark Stevenson. I'm here to discuss uh, Zoning Action 2017-10-Z. Um, I, I represent Rick Shaw, which is uh, a landowner uh, that is applied for this zoning. Uh, I also own a number of other development building companies adjacent to this piece of land uh, where we develop and build. Uh, so some of my comments today are kind of a little bit broader than me than the specific uh, something that we're trying to get done. So um, uh, yesterday, um, your, your senior staff was very gracious uh, to meet with me uh, to kind of discuss some of the open zoning items. I have three steps that, um, that I can't live with at the moment, and, and we'll go over those in detail in a few minutes. But um, I, cha I challenged I challenged your staff, and by the way, uh, Commissioner Crow and Commissioner Pownell were at that meeting and sat in and made some comments, uh, just so uh, everybody knows who was there. Um, I am, I am, my, my comments today are meant to be very constructive, they're meant to be challenging, and they're meant to push Paulding into looking at different ways of doing zoning and dealing with businesses. Um, the process that we have, the, the zoning process, the process that we have now is not transparent. Um, and it does a lot of things that discourages new zonings and makes it more difficult for people who, who zone to compete in the county. Uh, and, that, and some of my comments are going that direction. So the first, the first, the first item is that um, when, when, a, when, a, when a developer or, or someone comes and rezones something in Baldwin County, um, it is impossible at the beginning before you pay your $5,000 fee or $3,000 fee to figure out how much it costs to build out the site. We literally have to apply for the zoning and wait till 24 hours before it's voted on to find out how much it's going to cost for our site to be, for, for, for our zoning to be done. Uh, that is not transparent, it's not fair, and it, and it, and it creates a huge amount of work for us trying to either negotiate with the county to undo it or go back to our landowner or the people we're buying the land from and reset the whole deal. It's very disruptive. Um, I would suggest a better way to do it is to is to make all that stuff transparent up front where we can where where we can much earlier uh, learn what those costs are. My zoning came back with 19, 19 stipulations that cost $10,500 per lot, which is over $2 million for my site. Now my zoning was a little bit smaller in this case, so initially it was a month starter. We spent hours, months ago, working through those things and knocked it down, and, and we have, you know, staff has understood some of my concerns, and we did get it down to, um, $2,500 per lot plus one item, we have no idea what it costs still. And I'll go through this in a minute. So um, in, in, in other counties, in other municipalities where I do zonings, we don't have to deal with this. We don't get jagged with $1,000 lot, lot fees at the, at the last minute. We know well, very early in the process what we're doing with so we can negotiate properly, and it makes it easier to finance our deals. So. Um, do you have the do you have the uh, zoning steps in front of you? Did they give that to you? It's in the background. Okay, you got it. Okay, so 
Um, I've got, I've got uh, three specific zoning steps that um, I, would, I would like you to consider changing. I, again, I don't like the fact that there's 19 zoning steps. I believe the reason there's 19 zoning steps is because many of the ordinances in the county are outdated and old. So over the years, instead of fixing the ordinances, what has happened is the staff is adding zoning step. Don't fix the ordinance, add a zoning step. That gets you through it. What you ought to do is go fix the zone, fix the ordinance. Everybody can tell up front what's going to happen. You understand what the cost is. There ought to be three or four zoning steps because of very unique items on the site. Um, I can live with most of the zoning steps, but there's three or four that are very onerous, and I just kind of run, want to run them past you and go, go, go through that. So the first, the first one I want to talk about is zoning step number 10. Uh, only, owner, owner developer agrees to submit a water and sewer plan at preliminary plat submittal, including an analysis of existing infrastructure improvements may be required. So, um, may I continue speaking? I didn't know I had a time limit. I need, I need about 10 more minutes. I need to hear what Mr. Stevens has to say. We're making a motion. Make a motion to allow Mr. Stevenson to continue. Motion to continue. Is there a second? Stevenson, I will second the motion. Thank you. And a motion to second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Mr. Crow, welcome back. Is everything okay? <clears throat> yes, sir. For clarification, my wife does not carry a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> She's smarter than most. So, may I have one more minute? <laughs> Okay, so so zoning so, so zoning zoning step ten. Uh, it, when, when a developer builds a site, it has to be, it has to put in the infrastructure that's on its site. There is also sewer infrastructure between the site and the sewer plant. There is also water infrastructure between the site and the sewer plant that has capacity limitations. And at some point, those a lift station might hit capacity where the sewer plant might hit capacity and be upgraded. What this step means is that nobody in the county keeps up with those capacity situations um, up front. And we apply, hang on a second, let me finish. We, 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 buy, we have to go and file a preliminary plant and then the county can say, oh, this lift station needs a pump upgrade. $50,000 if you want to keep going. Or the the um, sewer plant is going to run out of capacity. You can only pull 50 permits instead of 200 permits. I needed to know that up front. Um, the county needs to know that up front. I, I did a zoning in Woodstock about three months ago, a very complicated zoning, and I left the zoning with a letter of sewer capacity and water capacity that said, if you build these lots within X number of months, the sewer system works. That is what Pauline County needs to do. Now, in order to do that, you have to plan and know what all those upgrades are up front and fix the, um, the tap fee where if it is not covering it, everybody pays it. So when it, everybody gets it, one developer is not getting stuck with, with, with this infrastructure or they're not held up artificially because, the, because things have not been planned. It's a, it's a very different way of doing business. This is the way it was done when things were going through the crash, but it is obsolete. I, I compliment the um, commission for wanting to do, you're, you're, you've done a moratorium and you're going you're gonna to change, you're going to put new zoning categories in. Do not stop there. Fix this stuff and help us, help us understand our costs so that we can be competitive. Okay, so I cannot live with that. I cannot live with a zoning step where I don't know what it costs. I can't. I, I need to know if there's off-site infrastructure costs and nobody can tell me right now. All right, so that's, that's my own unknown one. Number two, um, step number nine, owner developer agrees to participate in the Braswell Mountain Water Service Improvements. Um, that step is a little bit mysterious, but the county has told me that that means that my site needs to pay $1,000 per lot when I build a permit to help pay for 
this, this improvement. Now the Braswell Mountain improvement was a water tower that was built many years ago. Uh, the water tower gives pressure to many of the homes in, po in, the, in the Cedar Crest corridor. So everybody in Seven Hills, everybody in Bent, Bent Water, there's thousands and thousands of homes that benefit from this, this upgrade. It's already been paid for, but instead of recouping the costs from everybody, you know, the, the, the water system customers aren't paying a piece, the, um, the tap fees apparently aren't covering it, they've decided that only on new zonings will they charge this fee. So there's very few, there's been three new zonings in the last five years, there's a few on the agenda, and there's, there's going to be more coming, you'll eventually pay for it, but it creates a massive competitive disadvantage Literally, the builder next door that has a lot that has, doesn't have to be zoned can pay $1,000 less for their permit than I do. Now, you may not think that's a lot of money, but when you're building a $200,000 house and we, we count nails, it is a huge uh, competitive disadvantage. I, I, I suggest that a better way to do it would be to simply raise the tap fee for everybody and have everybody pay the same fee. You can raise it $1,000. I'm glad to pay it but make my competitor pay it too where there's a level playing field. Uh, secondly, on the Braswell Mountain, we did, a, we did, a, did an open records request and came up with the, the original report that uh, suggested on how this would do it. And there's a whole multi-page recitation that, in fact, tap fees were going to be used to pay for the Braswell Mountain upgrade. Somewhere along the line, somebody changed the rule to Let's just charge the new zonings. Now, it's hard to go change tap fees. But, again, we have an outdated system. Let's go fix the system. <coughs> Treat everybody the same so we can be competitive. I have 100 competitors in my marketplace. And I'm going to compete against thousands and thousands of lots that do not have to go through zoning. You're already asking me to upgrade my zoning with larger lots. You want better facades on the house. And you really want me to pay another thousand, twenty-five hundred dollars per lot? Really? That's five hundred and fifty thousand dollars on this site, and I'm not getting any extra lots. My zoning does not give me extra lots. I could just stay with R2. So I have to pay five hundred fifty thousand, or I stay with R2. No change in lots. I get a better product if I go with PRD because I can match the other part of the neighborhood. So again, I would I I I, I, I can't live with that. Uh, the th the third the third one is the uh, is step number six. Owner developer agrees to enter a development agreement with Paulding County to mitigate traffic concerns. Now there's two pieces to that this. There's an on-site infrastructure piece that we're negotiating, and I'm in total agreement. We've got to figure out how to do it. That does not benefit anybody outside my site. So we need to pay for that. And we need to negotiate whatever that agreement is and pay for it. We just haven't done it yet. Uh, the second piece of it is there's an intersection, Seven Hills Boulevard and um, Nature Walk Parkway, which is an entrance of my subdivision that has been slated to have a red light. They want this site to pay about $100,000 to fund that, in, in, in that intersection upgrade. Well, the Seven Hills developer, that was waived. The Nature Walk developer, that was waived. There was no requirement to participate in that. Now all of a sudden, we have, we have, uh, and by the way, there's another parcel out front where the county only charged $25,000 for participation on 172 lot subdivision. Now I got a 200 lot subdivision, you want me to throw in $100,000 on something that benefits everybody. To me, this is something that should have been planned, it should have been worked into the building permit fees and tap fees or whatever the fees you want and everybody should be charged fairly. So I've got, I've got $2,500 per lot, which is $550,000 plus an unknown sewer cost that you can throw on me once I file my preliminary plat. And as of today, my site is not economically buildable because of that. So um, I don't want any breaks. I, want to be, I just want to be treated the same. And I think, I think the county would be better off if that, if that, if that occurred. So um, my request to you today is to do one or two things. If you want to get this over with, I'd love to finish it. Um, I, I'd ask if you, you, you pass this with those three steps deleted. 
Uh, however, I am in no hurry on this thing. I put this thing out a year and a half before I need the lots. Uh, staff and the commissioners have indicated they may want to do more work on this and look at my comments and see if this is appropriate to make some adjustments to. I'm more than happy to do a table, and if you want to go that route, I would request you put it back on the agenda for the July meeting to give us a good time to go get the election and give staff time to meet and the commissioner's time to really think this out a little bit more. It's up to you. I mean, you have other alternatives as well. Uh, I really appreciate the extra time. Uh, I think I'm 30 seconds under my extra 10 minutes. So any questions or comments? I, yeah. I have one. And yes, I don't normally talk <clears> this sort of thing, but I do think it's disingenuous to say that this staff does not plan. I've been here 21 years and all 21 of them, there have been stipulations on zonings. Many of these stipulations can be found in the development regulation book, which as you know, is a quite lengthy document. So there are ways to find the answers to what you're talking about. Also, the Braswell Mountain Water uh, fee has been on every rezoning that I can recall in the last couple of years. So that was certainly discoverable. Um, I'm sure the staff has things to say otherwise, but I don't think that it's fair to the staff to say they do not plan. Thank you, ma'am. Speak. <clears throat> Certainly. So, so um, I, 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 I don't believe there's going to be any argument in this room that Paulding County is dozens of years behind in planning. I'm not saying you don't plan. There's there's plan books all over this county. There's four or five multi-year plans most of which are 10 or 12 years behind in implementation. You don't plan. You don't, you don't think ahead. You don't communicate it to the developers. And again, You're not I good at that. I'm sorry. You can call me disingenuous. It's the I, truth, and it's the fact that everybody in the room knows it. Oh my God. I don't know that. I, think I don't know that. People disagree with you. Okay. Well, and then and that, that's fine. Show that's more fine. Respect I respect to the staff I was, than that. This, the the uh, public participation isn't meant to be a, a public hearing, so uh, appreciate your comments, Morgan. Okay. And, uh, the skipper certainly deserved to respond, and uh, that he did. But um, let's move on. I will. I will say one thing. Okay. You, you, you can sit down. We've got a process and to say things aren't transparent is not fair. Um, there's, a, there's a process where things go through planning and zoning. And there's all kind of, uh, there's a planning and zoning meeting and they make a recommendation to send on to us. And there's all kind of work that goes into that. Um, process is transparent and I, our staff would count on our staff to look out for our county look out for the citizens of the county and there's actually things in the past and I think you and I discussed this there's things that have happened in the past that I don't agree with I wasn't here and I don't agree with it and sometimes when we allow things to happen whether it's staff planning the zoning or board of commissioners it, last stop comes to the board of commissioners and builders or developers or whoever else are allowed to do certain things sometimes what happens is years down the road somebody else has to pay for that that homeowner doesn't know people aren't aware there's traffic congestions that have happened um, there's school issues. But so many times what happens is the, the Board of Commissioners, the government, backed by the taxpayers, end up fixing the problem. And there have been times in the past that I feel like things weren't looked at correctly. And, and we're dealing with some of those problems now. But to say things aren't transparent, um, there's that's not correct. Um, 
I, had, I sure don't want to bring elections into it, but I hope that whoever's sitting on this board today and in the future, years to come, will always look out for the best interest of the citizens of the county, the citizens that live in the county, because we've got to look out for them because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are going to pick up the tab. And uh, I know that the staff has, give, give, has given you a lot of time. We spent a lot of time yesterday. We didn't agree on a lot of things. Um, but we have a process, and that process can be gone through. And, um, and there's a lot of time when you're in the planning zoning meeting for people to speak on both sides. And um, hopefully we can work through this. But I expect our staff, and I expect myself, and I expect my fellow commissioners, our county attorney to look out for the citizens of this county, look out for the county as a whole. I may not always agree with what has to happen, but at the end of the day, I, I, I do not expect our staff or anybody else to make a decision for somebody that's going to help that person out that's going to cost the taxpayers money years down the road and let's not know about it so we'll get on i appreciate your comments i appreciate the board allowing you to speak more than your five minutes that's something that i have fought for up here to make sure that landowners and citizens in this community have the right to come to these meetings and be heard that's i i think that has to happen Okay, so I, I do appreciate that. Sometimes we'll agree to disagree, and we'll move on, but we will talk again. Thank you. And just one concluding remark. The purpose of the moratorium by the board commissioners and the staff's um, central research and contributions to that uh, is to uh, reevaluate and come up with solutions with a 5-0 vote. I won't chime in that. I'm I'm the one to move this thing forward for the moratorium. Uh, we can look at things some stipulations. And I have spent a lot of hours with Mark yesterday. I want y'all to know that this staff here, five of these are sitting here today, where we spent some time with Mark yesterday discussing this. And we don't agree on everything. Um, our job up here is to protect the citizens take what's happening around the citizens um, and I understand what Mark Stevens agenda is is to sell houses to make a living make money but our interest is this county not how much money we make on the house so forgive us if we cross swords on that uh, I'm not going to be caught selling the people out uh, the purpose of building houses a certain way Okay, let's move on. Uh, consent agenda, let's discuss action number two consent agenda items. Number one is to appoint Matt Lowe to fill the unexpired term of Chris Wheeler on the Planning and Zoning Commission as representative for post one. The term ending December 31st, 2018. And number two, and bear with me, we're required to read all this, uh, declared items are listed as surplus and approve their disposal through option of trade. The Sheriff's Department has car unit uh, S-06, I'm sorry, 106, 2004 Crown Dick, serial number 2FAFP, 71W, 7YX129406. <coughs> the Fire Department has truck unit 543, a 2002 Ford Explorer, serial number 1FM, Z U 72 K 62 U D 56883. And under the Parks and Recs Department, a truck unit 452, which is 1995 Ford F 250, serial number of 1 F T H F 25 Y X S N A 84491. 
Would any of the commissioners like to move either of those two items for regular business? Hearing none, we'll leave them on the consent agenda and under old business, discuss action on 2017-10-2. Application by Rickshaw Real Estate LLC to rezone approximately 50.57 acres from R2 suburban residential to PRD planned residential development for subdivision development in Seven Hills. The property is located in lots 484, 485, 524, 525, 556, District 3, Section 3. North of Nature Walk Parkway, east of Williams Road, in Post 4. The recommendation was approval with a vote of 501 with 19 stipulations. It was tabled from December 12, 2017, Board of Commissioners meeting. Pass that microphone down to Ms. Littman. updates or comments in? Mm -hmm. um, this time, um, don't really have anything to add, just uh, you know, the applicant presented um, two options he seemed willing to entertain, and um, Chris Robinson's here as well, if there's any questions you have for him. Board, have any additional comments or considerations or questions? Action to approve 2017-14 Zulu application by J and A Construction and Home Builders to rezone approximately 71.38 acres from R2 Service for the residential low density quality residential development district to build 150 residential homes. The property is 71.38 acres in size is located in land lots 616, 617, 618, and 619 in District 3, Section 3. It's on the east side of Cedar Crest Road south of Cedar Crest Boulevard in post four. Uh, the recommendation uh, the planning commission was denial of a vote of four of one one with 19 stipulations. <laughs> this was tabled on January the 23rd of 2018 at the board commission's meeting. Any further discussion on this whole business item number two? It also had 19 stipulations. Old business number three is discuss action to adopt resolution 18-10 confirming executive session for the purpose of pending potential litigation from the February 27th, 2018, 7 p.m. Board Commissioners meeting. And again, this is the resolution because we went into closed session twice that day. So you adopted the one for the morning and this is the one for the evening. We had that in the backup material, so discussion need. Um, under new business discuss action to approve the chairman's nomination of James T. Trevor Hess to the position of Chief Marshal and it's uh, quite an honor to have someone that's uh, been among us for many years uh, uh, Lieutenant Hess uh, with the Santa Fe Trail High School, I never found out where it was. New Mexico or something? Yeah. 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 <laughs> From uh, 1999 to 2013, uh, Trevor was uh, working for the Paul County Sheriff's Office uh, at the Detention Center for several years, the Patrol Division, the Crime Suppression Unit. Uh, and then 2013 to today, he has been with the Marshall Bureau, currently uh, in charge of the day-to-day. -day. He's been on the patrol division there, the security division, and uh, uh, sergeant, patrol, uh, sergeant of the patrol unit. His certifications include uh, basic peace officer certification, 
field training officer certification uh, as a radar operator and LIDAR operator. Uh, I, he's an instructor and just a general instructor and then a firearms instructor. Uh, I'm not going to read all the advanced training that he's had, uh, but I would like to point out a couple of awards. In 2003, uh, Lieutenant Hess received the Distinguished Service Medal at Pauling County uh, in the Sheriff's Office. More recently, in 2012, he was awarded the Medal of Merit by the Pauling County Sheriff's Office. So, uh, anybody else feel free to comment, but uh, Lieutenant Hess has certainly shown his initiative and uh, attitude toward uh, our code enforcement in the county, and uh, it's, it's going to be great to be able to vote on him this afternoon. Comments? I'd like to say that he's already on the job. I've discussed some things with him. He's uh, taking care of some matters. I'm, in fact, I asked him this morning when I came in, I said, how do you get that done? And I'm not going to elaborate on what he said. He's taking care of the job. I appreciate the work he's doing. Uh, the work that I've seen the department doing, working together as a team. So thank you forward to this afternoon's vote. Yes. And I also think it's worth mentioning, I appreciate Frank and the work that uh, you've done as interim chief marshal to, uh, to, to, to help in that area. And I'm um, glad you're here to be able to help in that way and looking forward to, uh, looking forward to the future. But thanks also, Frank, for all your work on this. And you want to add some comments about uh, the process? I, I appreciate it. Um, uh, Trevor has done an outstanding job uh, for the last couple of months. He's really uh, helped us get uh, and moving forward. As, as y'all can recall, uh, just last meeting we were here and had a change in the ordinance, which hadn't been done since the adoption of that ordinance uh, 31 years ago. So he's been involved in helping us with that and animal control and, and moving uh, moving the business forward uh, for this board and for the county. So uh, I think it's a very good recommendation. I support it 110%. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. New business number two, discuss action authorize the chairman to enter into an agreement with Kelly Landscape Management Incorporated for the uh, roadside right-of-way turf maintenance services contract in the amount of 176087 dollars and 73 cents the contract provided for provides for finished mowing string trimming aging and litter pickup of approximately 65 acres of which 2.5 of that's the median um, and also 54 55.44 acres on the roadside shoulders on various county roads and our backup material had a list of all the county roads which has uh, increased over the the last couple of years. Mr. Jones. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, this is a you know, contract we've had. This will be our third year with Kelly Landscaping Services. Um, we had an initial year and then we had an option of two more years provided both parties were agreeing with the, uh, the work in the contract. We've been very happy with the work provided by Kelly. Um, the roads, the turf areas look very good. They clean up the litter every two weeks, so it, uh, it looks really nice. And unfortunately, there is a cost associated with this that we but uh, it's something that uh, uh, we recommend. So, um, we do 17 cycles per year. It's mowing, edging, litter pickup. Um, goes through late March through the late October. Um, I, may have, I can answer any questions on this. If you have any. The only thing that I thought of in reading the material was, again, the growth of this program. and. I guess ideally you'd have 100% of your roads covered. As far as selection of the roads? Typically they've been projects that uh, the DOT has worked on where we've done uh, roadway and associated uh, you know, landscaping or um, you know, the size of the roads and meeting areas like that. So you're right, this, this program has grown over the last three years and it will continue to grow in the future as we add new roadway projects and construction projects. <coughs> George, would you mind naming a couple areas or roads that, that just for the public? Because I've had a couple of questions on it, but yeah, it's going to continue to, to grow. 
Uh, certainly, uh, Commissioner, you know, we have uh, Bill Carruth Parkway, obviously, is the biggest area going from you know, 278 um, and Jimmy Lee Smith all the way to 278 at Wendy Bagwell, um, Cedar Crest Road, Seven Hills um, Connector is another area that's pretty large. Um, we have intersections at uh, uh, East Paulding, um, Dallas Ackworth, um, Nebo, uh, Dallas Nebo areas like that. All over the county. Exactly. <laughs> wherever, wherever there's turf, we're on it. <laughs> this is going to be on number three here. Also, discuss action to authorize the chairman to sign a quick claim deed to abandon a portion of the right of way of Old Ovo Road. Community help lines right here. And this is basically just a house, housekeeping item. Um, this was brought to our attention by John Tripnani, surveyor in the county, and uh, he was doing some work for a uh, citizen. And basically, the property owner at 324 Volvo Road, they couldn't close their property because they couldn't get a clear title. So this is a very small parcel. It's less than 0.01 acres, tiny. We don't have any legal way to actually access it, so it's just something that uh, it's good for them and it's good for us to get off the books. Yeah, it's a remnant. Thank you very much, George. Thank you. Thank you. New business item number four is discuss action to adopt resolution 18-11 adopting the Paulding County branding concepts for use in the community. And we have our public uh, information manager, Jeff Parkins, with us. And he brought along a, actually a, a school system employee, Mr. Luke and Crook, who's helped us immensely with this project. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I will uh, keep this uh, as quick as possible. Basically, uh, what we want to present to you today is a uh, logo and slogan concept we've come up to brand the county um, in a partnership with uh, the Paulding County School District. So we have the pleasure of working with Logan Crook, um, who actually created the new Paulding County School District's uh, logo that they recently changed. Um, and he basically took our concept and our vision and created a simple, elegant logo that um, won't replace our county seal, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll try to show what sets us apart from other counties uh, with our uh, highlighting our outdoor beauty and recreational advantages, our upcoming water independence, and uh, showing the sun rising on a new day in Pullman County. Uh, with the slogan, Explore and Wine Thrive, Explore is there's so many places to go out in the county and explore. Our parks, um, you know, the WMA if you'd like to, uh, uh, the new reservoir coming soon. Um, there's plenty of areas shopping to, to explore in this county. Uh, unwind kind of speaks for itself. You know, go to for a run on the trail, take a bike ride on the Silver Comet, go shopping, go eat at one of the many restaurants, and then uh, thrive. This is a uh, economic development driven. You know, we have great health care, we have great schools, uh, we have great businesses here in Baldwin County. So we want to show that you can actually uh, thrive living here in Baldwin County. Uh, with this, we look forward to building a, a county marketing campaign behind this. And uh, this will also be shown prominently on the new uh, Baldwin.gov web redesign effort. So with that said, do you have any questions? I think it was good. All right. I like it and I appreciate your work and your enthusiasm about it. Um, that's what I that's what I'm excited about the most. So thank you for that and taking the lead. Good work, both of you. Would you comment on other people that were on your team, please? Absolutely. I, I meant to do that, but it was Angela and Rebecca and myself worked with Logan. We all got together and it, it worked out great. Logan's amazing. He's really good. He can explain to you you know, the colors we, we chose and, um, you know, he took what we had in our minds and quickly we were able to put it out there in a real simple and elegant uh, logo. So all credit goes to him. He's really great. Any comments, Logan? No, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and to work on this. Everybody's a great team to work on. It. It's been a thrill to be here. Thank you. Greg, appreciate your help and your creativity. Thanks, sir. All right, thank you very much.
presented. Thank you all. New business item number five is discuss action to approve the May 1st, 2018 employee benefits plan renewal. Mr. Brian Acker. Thank you, Brian. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Appreciate the opportunity to come before you today to go over the May renewal. I'd also like to recognize and introduce a couple of folks that help us with our benefits from Dave's Pencil Mayor, Gary Jacobs, and David Easter. They're an integral part, they're behind the scenes employees for all practical matters. Uh, if it wasn't for them and their systems, we wouldn't be able to put together as comprehensive of a package as we do. Um, also, want to thank y'all. I do this every year. I don't say this to be patronizing. Uh, we have had established and maintained a, uh, a position with our employee benefits to be competitive, comprehensive, yet keep it cost effective, uh, not only to the employees, uh, but to the citizens. And that's quite an objective, and it's also quite a challenge. And we have done that continuously through the years, and I appreciate y'all's support and help for that. It means a great deal to my staff as well as the employees. I have outlined in your backup material and have discussed with you the proposed benefits uh, renewal. Some good positive takeaways. We don't have any increases or changes in our life insurance costs our disability cost, our dental plan. We had those locked in for a couple of years. Uh, but one of the key things that I've discussed with you is we do have increases to the medical plan. Uh, we started off with a renewal uh, just based on underwriting formulas, which is really just getting to your claims history, of over 2.2 million. Uh, the renewal that was actually presented by Blue Cross was 14.7% or about 1.8 million. And after negotiations, that sounds to approximately 1.6 million. Um, talk to y'all, we cannot get around claims. We certainly have had a tough claims year. Uh, just to share a couple of things with you, when we talk about claims, what I'm saying is premiums paid relative to claims paid. Uh, a couple of tough months, and this is what we have the insurance for, so I don't want to make it a negative issue, but the fact of the matter is, uh, for the last 21 months, we've paid in for every, uh, the claims have been, uh, in ex or have been 93% of all money we have paid in. We have had months in the last year, uh, one month we had 138%. For every $100 we paid in, we paid 138 outing claims. Another month that was 121%, another 131%. It's hard to get around that, but that is part of what this is all about, is to take care of the welfare of our employees and their families. Um, over a 13-year period, I want to try to lighten this up a little bit. This is what I am proud of and I think uh, we're appreciative of. Our average over a 13-year period, again, this is tough here, but over 13 years is about 4.4%. If I could come before you today and say I can give you a, a health insurance plan that you will only have a 4.4% renewal for the next 13 years, I would be strongly, strongly suggesting you take it. Um, that's extremely difficult to come by, but as folks are seeing double digit increases every single year, year after year. Health inflation rate alone is about 17.5%. And if you want to see that as your renewal, you have to have about 80 to 85 percent of loss ratio on your premiums to claims paid. So again, over 20 uh, one month period, we have about 93 percent. You can understand where some of that increase come from, comes from. Uh, there are a couple of other positive takeaways I'd like to share with you. One of the cost saving measures we took several years ago was to implement the HRA plan. So we have three protective plans. We are seeing a migration towards those. Those are more cost-effective plans. Employees who have continued to stay in the point of service plan, uh, we do ask that they pay more towards the premium. It's a higher cost plan, but they do pay more if that's their decision for them and their family. Um, other things, if we, uh, if the renewal is approved, I want you to also be aware that yeah, we, we absolutely do share with the employees what this cost sharing arrangement is. Uh, we don't casually just pass out a piece of paper and let them know it's time to sign up for the benefits for the next year. Uh, we share with them the cost sharing arrangement. We let them know how much the commission is paying for it. We also, in turn, ask that they be good consumers. We want them to understand the mechanics of the plan. 
We want them to thoroughly understand that. We want them to understand how they can save themselves dollars and be good consumers. That all packaged together is what helps us keep our, our uh, rates down. It is a difficult challenge, as I mentioned, uh, but that's where we're at this year. Certainly be glad to answer any questions if you have them. You brought up and when I finally had an opportunity to sit down and read over this. Yeah. Uh, you or maybe someone from Jay Smith from here, can you explain a little bit more to me the PCOR and I fee? I would love to look at that much more. This was a fee that was made. Coming David. up here, David. Yeah. Oh, okay. This is related to the Affordable Care Act when uh, David comes up. As I ran over that, I think it's something everybody needs to know. I, I think it's a good point to share. Uh, over almost five hundred thousand dollars in uh, insurer fees related to the Affordable Care Act, and David is going to be able to explain Corey fees much better than me. So <coughs> let him do so. Uh, it, it, it's a very small fee that came about due to the Affordable Care Act um, and health care reform. It's um, projected to be on average less than a thousand dollars total for the county, uh, but it is something the county has to pay. Uh, again, due to the Affordable Care Act, and it stands for the Patient Centered Outcome Research um, Institute, which is just kind of a big acronym, if you will, for the fee is paid to sort of investigate what can we do to improve health care, how can we better coordinate with hospitals, doctors, pharmacists, things of that nature. Who receives that? It's sent to the IRS, and the IRS then gives it up to of the committees that are working on that research. And if you want to say who writes the check for that? The, the county does have to pay that under the law, and it's something that they write a check directly to the IRS every year. Your tax number is important. Any other questions? I'd just like to comment. So Ryan called me earlier this week when we talked about this. We've had that conversation since I've been in office every year it comes up. And I just want to say thank you, Brian, for the work that you put. This is a big number. Increases are big. Uh, but they're smaller than they would have been, uh, thanks to some negotiation uh, and hard work there by you and your staff. So we do appreciate that uh, and your efforts to help keep that number as um, reasonable as possible. So thank you, there. Appreciate that. I'd just like to say, um, we did the salary study and put that in effect last year in October. I guess it showed up in November. And then I, uh, you know, we had what what the federal government did. I call it the little Trump bump. <laughs> Got a little bit because of changing the income tax. This is a um, Brian. I appreciate we spent some time together on this. Um, in person, face to face, but this is a—it's a big—it's a big number, 1.6 million dollars, and um, to for the board of commissioners to pass that on to the employees, I, um, that would be a tough thing to do, especially after what we've done. So um, I appreciate the work. I appreciate the work you've done with Jason Smith Lanier. Um, but I just want everybody to know that you know, we do this every year, and here we are in March, and this affects next year's budget. And sometimes you vote on things that affects next year's budget, but you don't get dealing with next year's budget. You might be dealing with it now, and we are, and we are working on next year's budget, but it doesn't come full circle until that date in August. <coughs> But when you vote on this, this is in next year's budget, one way or another, whether it's on top of what you have now, or whether you find other places to take it so that you can pay for it. Um, I just want to remind everybody that that does show up. It doesn't it may not show up today. It's a vote today, but it will show up in starting in July, voted on in August. Uh, but uh, you work hard on it, and uh, insurance is something we all deal with each and every year. You know where I'm at. I'll, I'll make a major point on the uh, the amount that this is. Um, 
for each employee, this this equates to about a two thousand dollar per year. Uh, that's not an increase they see on their weekly my weekly paycheck, but certainly if they were to uh, be absorbing this, it would be significant two thousand a year. Well, about, about eighty a month of wage. Yeah, or eighty per check average. I'm sorry. Yeah, depending on the number of employees we have, we, we discussed it the other day. It's about seventy-six dollars ninety-two cents. So, yes, sir. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. And um, so, as we were talking about that, um, talking to department heads, and you know, it affects some people more than others. And as a commissioner, I told you, I I get it. I truly get it. And uh, so for our employees, uh, we've got to look out for our employees. And I expect them to work hard and look out for our citizens. And, we, and I think we've done a lot of that uh, in the last couple of years. And I just, again, I just want to make the board aware that we are voting on something that will come before you on a piece of paper come August. Thank y'all so much. Great brief, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I'd like to recognize <coughs> elected official Kim Cobb, who's here now. Thank you for being here, Kim. That's the conclusion of our regular business. And to ask a question, yes, sir. Sorry, I have a question for Lonnie. Um, new business item number three. We're talking about the uh, quickly in there. The word abandoned caught my eye. Are we legally required to have a formal public hearing on that? So we're in there, so no. Okay, thank you. Good question. <clears throat> we do have the need for executive session to talk about real estate and potentially in pending litigation. So at this time, I'd uh, entertain a motion to go into executive session. I move, we move to executive session for real estate and potential for pending litigation. Second. Okay, motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? We do have several real estate issues. Okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0, and uh, we're going into executive session. <laughs> we have uh, concluded the uh, executive session, and we will. Uh, I will call the, uh, the regular session back to order and report that uh, no action was taken in the executive session. Any other business commissioners have? Um, then I will uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, but before I get that motion, we'd like to announce that our normal 2 o'clock 1400 meeting will begin at uh, 2.30. Uh, so we will be back in here at 2.30 everybody's patience and you'll have a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. To adjourn by Commissioner Powell is the second. Second. Second by Commissioner Collette. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We're adjourned until 2.30.